was down a bit because I'm used to not having this and just trying to fill the <laughs> hall up and shouting. I should be uh, a ringmaster or something. But well, been a nice year, isn't it? Um, not if you're a gardener and not if you grow dahlias, but um, we've gone from two extremes. What you'll see here is based on last year, so I'm not that organised to get this year into <laughs> the screen yet. Um, but last year was, was so contrasting, certainly we're, I'm in Essex, South East, actually around the corner from Hyde Hall, which is the other RHS garden, that is known to be the driest spot in the country. That's why Hyde Hall is all dry gardens and things like that. And it has, I think from, oh, my, I grow on allotments and I have a slightly nerdy allotment neighbour that measures rain. And he was very bored because he couldn't measure any for three months. And it was, I think we had less than three millilitres of rain from May to about a week before showtime. Um, and then we had 13 mil, but that all happened literally five days before the first show in one downpour. Um, and growing on an allotment, and you'll see with watering cans only, not allowed to hose pipe on my allotments. Growing 400 plants that are probably take it in at least two to three gallons of water per plant per week. I should look like an orangutan. <laughs> <laughs> but last year it was the opposite, it was wet. And, and luckily I'm on a race, the allotment's 100 years old, um, just celebrated there for centenary last year, and then Peter Seabrook, who's a friend it was, a friend of local person there, sort of doing planting a tree and doing a hundred things, but it means that people have worked that ground for a hundred years and it's all about that much higher than the rest. So all that rain where people certainly in Essex on Essex clay were losing plants with root rot and everything else. It was raining through and mine were I was going happy days. That's about six and a half eight to eight hours less watering a week that I've got to do and I can actually grow the plants. But even this year, the plants still grow. As long as you give them what they want, they will grow. What is affected is the buds and the flowers. Um, what you'll see it generally take around about 30 to 35 days from a bud the size of a pea to be in a full flower. And if you subject them to, we had 40 odd degrees, that alone is one thing, but we had 30 odd degrees the week before, and even up to it 30 odd afterwards. They don't develop in the same way, and little things can make a big difference. Um, this is me. I've been doing this since I was 10. Um, not speaking. It took me a bit longer than that. I grew daily before I went to speak. But um, doing this since I was 10, which is 37 years. Um, I've been involved in a society all the way. I've seen a great record because I'm good at that. So I was the youngest person to become a judge. I had to get the rules changed to do it, because apparently you had to be 18 and an adult to pass an exam. Um, so I didn't agree with that. I was always a bit outspoken. Um, we got it changed by the time I was 17, I got to take the judging exam and passed it. Um, and then I won my first national championship when I was 19. Um, I've won the, I've had breaks, uh, Friends in the, in the society think, think I've had more comebacks than Frank Sinatra. Um, things get in the way like life, and they are only a flower, but we don't treat it like that. Um, so I had a 10 year break out and started growing again um, following a divorce that meant I could grow babies again. But uh, in the last 10 years, I've won the best exhibit at the National Show four times. Um, two of those years, I wasn't growing to move tests again. Um, but and it's different each time for a different thing. So I'm not, this is John Dex, but I'm not a one trick pony in that sense. When I was 23, I won the national championship for poms, for two inch poms, 12 bars is a six. Um, and every time I do something, I do it in a different way so that it's established. Because if you're going to do something, why do it the same as everyone else? How do I do it better? How do I set a new standard? How do I lift the bar a bit? Um, and spending, 30 odd years around some fairly uh, interesting Dahlia characters back in the day when they wandered around the show and their pipes. 
pumping away, and it was very much in the uh, the gentry and the gods of the society, you know, just here I am, and if I say that, and it was like, Mister, Mister, what's that? Why have I come second and asked these questions? So it's all changed now. <laughs> We're all a bit more sociable, and a little bit more open. The advent of YouTube and Facebook and computers means you spread. There is no secrets. Trust me, there is no secrets in this whatsoever. When I decided I'm going to grow Giant Dex, new challenge, something different, um, I went straight to Tony Kingdom, who is the best giant grower that's been alive. He's won that class in there I think 14 times. Derek Kingdom has won it 16 times, so he's not going to win anymore because he's not around. But um, Tony can. I went to him and I want to grow giants, Tony. Okay, I drove to Devon, picked up. 70 tubers straight from him, brought them home to grow them and compete against him. People just want to see people shown. And it's all down to what you do. So we all start at the same time, beginning of the year, I can give every one of you a cutting, and you've all got the same chance of winning a national championship as I have. It's just what you do to it. It's, it's not like I did grow daffodils for a bit as well. And that's a money game. You're buying a bulb, you're buying flour really, £25 for a daffodil bulb that will produce a show quality flower isn't skill. There's no skill in the growing. You plant it, it grows, it flowers, just got to make sure it flowers when you want to show it. Um, this is open to all. You learn it, you do it, put this into it, which you do, and the results will come. So this is my way. If you want to see other things, uh, the YouTube video has been going for about eight or nine years. And they go right through growing across the board when I was in the first place with 800 plants um, from ponds to, to large, won the individual championships here as well. It's in the same year I did it in Wales and Scotland as well. Um, that was the year I did nine shows, 3,000 miles. I drove in three weeks and I'm a bit of a lone ranger. Was. <laughs> um, so I do that on my own. Never use the same flower twice. That's it. Once you cut it, it goes to the show, you walk away and you leave it to start again. So you're only as good as your last show. Um, but what a giant dex is. I will never, this will be the only time I'll use the word dinner plate. They are not dinner plates. There is no classification in the books that says dinner plate. They are giant dex. If my dinner plate was that deep, I'll be a bit larger than I am now. Um, and they are what they are. Uh, you can never, when you look in the book, and there's, I think it's 15 classifications from you know, pond to giant, it's, it's not sizes, it's form, dexter, cactus, water lily, colorant, form, and so on. Anemone, which is very vague. Um, they're all different, and there's specialist classes in that hall, you can go down there for each of them. Uh, the chance is one that's been unchanged for years, years and years. I mean, the, the AC Barnes, which this was, was first awarded in 1954. So there, there's some history in these, and, and that's what you sort of buy into when you grow for them. Um, but this has remained unchanged from 1954. Before that, it was 12 vases for free. This is some class, but I've seen the pictures. They're not pretty. Um, and evolution along the lines bring out new varieties. But we're saying new varieties. Almond Climax here, 1960s. Um, Albus and Green have been around since the sort of 60s, 70s, and older. There's still an older one, the one in the middle there, the pink with a white top. Sir Alf Ramsey is only 20 odd years old. So it takes a while to bring in the new ones. I'm trying to think if there's anything new there. Probably the top three, the red, orange, and yellow, green turfle. You know the opera singer with big ginger hair? That's why it got named that. And then it's sported. And then they usually sports the seedlings. Sports, same flower, different colour. One seam changes colour. A little tweak in the, in the jeans, and you go, oh, I've got an orange one. And you can secure it. Once you've got it as a tuber, it stays the same. So the orange one is the sport with a red one. The yellow top right, lily white is the sport of the orange one. In daily years, you'll see families. Albus and cream, white Albus, and there's a cream Albus as well. And generally, it's etiquette 
that the person that raises it, it's a credit. This was a seedling. It was raised um, in America. Uh, Jack Harmon raised this one from uh, New Zealand uh, many, many years ago. And if you have a sport, you, you keep that origination in there. So Alba Supreme, White Alba Supreme Alba. Almond's Climax, there was a sport, Kids Climax. Unfortunately, um, Mr. White from Ireland just didn't agree with that. <laughs> so, Green Turtle became Aggie White, which was his mum. And then Aggie White sported his boy to the yellow one, and became Bluey White, his dad. So, it's hard to see the connection sometimes when you're looking at names that they are not really. So, this was the goal, this was the aim. I've never grown giants, certainly more than one variety which is all you tend to need for the individual championships. So it's a big learning curve. But I spent years listening to these old boys, the, the Tom Beckett and the Derek Hughes. You've got an MBE for doing this bounce. No, I'm not, not old enough yet. But listen, and say, oh, I've got this fantastic flower. And, and do you know what? It come out the ground like a, like a steam train and it had this big flower on it. And it's stuck in my head that all these great flowers, all these best blooms in show, the top right one is the best bloom in show at the National Day, um, come out of the ground. There's something in this, but I don't think we ever try to get all the flowers out of the ground. So I thought, how am I going to do that? Because if I want to raise the bar, I don't want one great flower, I want 12 great flowers. Um, and interest, this crane cup, is for the best exhibit show, so the whole thing. The last time the Giant Dex has won that was 20 years ago, which was very beautiful. So the bar hadn't been raised enough to catch any interest until recently. That's how we start. That's how all pages start the tumour. Um, people think I've got these, you know, we have these lavish setups with greenhouses and everything else. This is the largest greenhouse I've ever had. And I picked it up on Facebook Marketplace like you do. Someone's got a greenhouse in the garden, don't want it. Come and take it down, £100, and I've got a 10 by 8 aluminium glass greenhouse. It's actually in the car park at work. Um, this way I'm safe as life goes on. I'm, I'm now a director of the company, so I'm pretty much set there for life. The plants are growing with a lot of them, so it doesn't matter where I live. I'm sort of all right. I'm safeguarded, sorry, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> for, for future events. But yeah, 8 by 10 greenhouse. This is actually beginning of this year. Last year it was a 6 by 8. And out of there, I can produce about 900 plants from the tubers. We always select the best tubers. Natural selection is there. But you'll always find that one or two plants will just be that little bit better, that, that little bit. The same when you go on, if you're going to take cuttings of a plant and you've got three of them, which one's the biggest, strongest, flower the most? Use that one, take cuttings from there, and you will improve the gene ball, improve the, the selection. So it's only like, you know, Ben Newsom, it's three tubers, it's not massive, but it's all you need. Because of the way we grow them, and you'll see that, the stems are very, very large. They are naturally on giants anyway, but even on the smaller stuff, they're given the cotton wool treatment and it means it's, they're kept soft and they grow. And as we know, the daily is the thing that wants to rot is the stem if you're trying to store the tubes over it. So we create our own problems by doing that. When you get them in a little packet, they're growing very close together. When you wheat soil them and not feed the whole thing, it gives you a nice thin stem and a swim tube. These tubes are huge. Um, so we tend to, I tend to not lift the tubers until, it um, depends on the weather really, but towards the end of November. Certainly where I am, we don't really see frost till well into November. Um, and the plants tend to harden up anyway. So I'll wait till then, if we haven't had a frost, generally the night temperatures have come down to a point where it stopped growing. If you don't want to keep the tubers up, that's still live and growing. That's why you wait for a frost, it, it, it shuts it down. Because if you cut them, they want to grow. And you can't store something that wants to grow. But because of these stems that want to grow, this will be about the first week of January. They go on to heat, 70 degrees, just to wake them up. Once they're awake, you can turn it right down and just keep them ticking over. 
um, and they're alive and they're growing. That's the sort of tuber that you can end up with, especially with how I do it. And see the three stems, that's unusual for a daily tuber from a cutting. So they're all that are grown from cuttings. You normally have a single stem, and the reason there's three is what you'll see coming up. But that is one tuber grown from a single cutting taken in the middle of April. So they, they don't hang about. And if you look after them, they grow and grow quick. That's Bonaventure, another American variety. We all spread them around. Normally arrive at in and out of the countries, sorry, our actions, um, in coffee tins or wrapped up as a Christmas present to someone. Um, because otherwise you, look, you can't move them around the world. Now the other way you can do it is pot tubers. Um, so these are pot tubers and they're basically over extra cuttings. Because of the problem with certainly some varieties and the size of tubers and not seeing them, just take cuttings and leave them in a free up to a five inch pot, so you know, new money, nine, ten centimetre or thirteen centimetre. Um, water them, don't feed them, you'll get this nice small tuber with a nice small stem, much like you get in the, in the Dutch packets. And you can keep stuff in varieties that you don't want to grow yet or you haven't got room. That way, just tuck them somewhere out of the way, throw some water out now and again, and you get these pot tubers. And with some varieties, the health, especially the old ones, breaks down when you go from a plant that you've pushed. You take out from it the following year every week. From pot tubers, they don't, they keep the health. So it's a good way of protecting the stock, it's a bit like a seed bank, I suppose, in that way. And these are only seed trays, so you can see how many you can fit in a seed tray opposed to these giant tubes that are in crates that you can only fit a few. And the cuttings come always from the ground. Um, there's a couple of pot tubers, these were sent to me by another giant grower in Scotland to show against it. Um, but you see where they grow. Never ever, please, I'm sorry Mrs. Raven, but I think you should keep quiet. Um, never ever take the cuttings and take a piece of tuber with it. What is, there is no, no benefit whatsoever apart from destroying any future cuttings. Um, you cut the cutting here. And you see these are the bits either side, they're the next cuttings. So if you take that eye out, you've got it, it's gone. That's it, over. You've got to hope for more eyes. From one tuber, you can get 30 plants, but you can't if you're going to chop the eye out every 10 minutes. You know, you get your three or four and so it's gone. If you're going to do that and you don't need many plants, at this stage, even, you've got one, two, three, three eyes. Get the knife out, chop it up. Just cut the tube, bring the three, pop them up, you've got three plants. If that's all you need, great. You're not even trying to grow roots, they've already got it. They've got it on the tube and so. In a garden way, if you only want to multiply small numbers, wake them up, split them up. Never plant the dormant tube. Very much weather reliant, you're worrying about ground temperature, unless it's over 10 degrees, they just sit there. Um, and that's ground temperature, not air, it takes a while to warm up. Just pop it in a pot, especially in these, not that big. Wake it up on the windowsill, plant it as a growing plant, or divide it and plant them as growing plants. And you'll probably be able to get flowers from those. I've had daily achievements that I've just broke up, planted out and flower by the end of May. And we know why we grow daily because they don't stop flowering. So you've got them for the years. So it's just simple practices, but for me, old cuttings, I want controllable batches of plants that I can, it's a bit like farming at times, but I can control the plant. I want my plants, and they do flower literally from the first show to the last show, and there's nothing after, nothing before. All the thousand flowers will come out in a three week period. You can't do that by just planting the tuber and hoping it shoots at the right time. There's a cutting, normally two to three weeks, three weeks early in the season, two weeks once you get a bit of light. If you find you're getting black leaf, which seems to be more and more common, where the base of the cutting rots and goes black, it's normally too much humidity, you're over caring. It's especially prevalent um, with the rise of big free composts or additives going into composts or Place P. If it's got green material in there, don't use it for cuttings um, because it's breaking down, it's rotting, it's going to create 
thing, the things that are rot in the compost will rot your cutting. Um, if you use a coir compost for rooting, that's fine, or anything, but the least free material at this point, if you leave them, if you them in sharp sand, that's fine, it, they will work. Um, in fact, some grows only use that. So once you've got that, you're away. That's your time. Get in a pot and get it growing. Then you take cuttings. Yeah, someone's have to go in there overnight. <laughs> um, you get more and more. And by starting early, so I, I will produce from that bench, which is a, a six foot by three foot heat mat, um, at least 900 plants. And I'm stopping myself at that point. You know, yeah, how many more can I squeeze in it? Cuttings, if you can, when it's time to take them, that middle of April window, always tend to use cell trays, because if you grow in open trays, the roots start doing this, and when you go to separate them out, you're going to damage roots. And anything that you do that could give a plant the check you want to avoid, certainly when you're trying to get these things to their absolute potential. So that's one tray, Fedora Valentine, if you ever find it, buy it from Halls, Award of Garden Merit. Love it, dark foliage, bright red flowers, great garden variety as well as a, a great giant. Um, 40 in there, it's a 40 cell tray, all of the same, all hopefully going to root. Only one 12 to plant in the ground. But over the time, I will go, well, I don't know if I'm looking at you, I don't know if I'm looking at you. You root it very quickly, you root it quite late, and you narrow it down to a batch. And I suppose it's stock selection ongoing at the time. And then your main batch time, so there's 40 in each of those trays, and I'll do that probably a couple of times in that early to mid April window. Go back to the tubes again, let it flush up, do it again. Straight into three inch pots, um, square pots, doesn't really matter, the plant don't care if it's square, round, or hexagonal. Um, square pots just mean it fits on the bench better, and when you water, you water all the, all the water goes in the compost, not onto the bench. And, Elsewhere, you're not watering the gaps. In an ideal world, and, and growing the other stuff, I would only want these cuttings to be in that size pot for about three weeks. Because beyond that, the, the, it will fill with root, the fertiliser will vanish in the compost, and then I'd move them into a five inch pot, and then there'd be a couple of three weeks in that, by which time we're in the ground. So, middle of April cutting, two weeks to eight, we're at the beginning of May. Three weeks in that, which was the end of May, and we're planting the first week of June. So it's a very little <coughs> precise window, but it's all it needs. Keep them growing. The moment they go yellow or hard, look at the tomato plants, look at the seed leaves. If they're yellow or non existent, it won't, it won't bear good fruit. It's hard, it's locked up. Pick the young, soft one that looks a bit wiggly, but as long as it's short, it wants to grow. But with the boat system I've tried, going through a ground cover fabric, I didn't want a big pot and I wanted quite a tall plant. So they stayed in these pots, so I added extra wood feed. So when I was watering, there'd be a, a balanced feed, something like milk grow a scoop. Um, and if I felt I needed it, I'd use a long food and milk grow long food, which is very high nitrogen. It doesn't have to go on the box, just sit it on the box. Um, and then just keep it soft and growing. If you get them outside once they've got some root, grow and cool, it stops from doing that. There's a the ground, there's one plot. They're only half plots according to the allotments. Uh, um, you can get about 175, 180 in, in each plot. They're all hand dug. I do nothing for ease. Ease is fine. If it's easy and it's best for the plant, I'll do it. But if it's not best for the plant, I'll break them back and I'll do the artwork because that's what I'm trying to do. So it's hand dug, um, trench dug every year, and then normally I'll put the fertiliser and tickle over with a rotate just to mix in the soil. Rotivating isn't good for soils long term, especially if you're on clay, which you create a pan. So that what you just create a, a pond liner in clay. Um, it doesn't do a lot of good for the worms and things that are in there that you do want. So it's a quick tickle. You do it with the rain, um, but there's a bit. This one had to have a cover built on it, but that got done during the year. They are hungry, so those beds got that. It's 50 kilos of the equivalent of Vitex Q4. Um, it's just cheaper when you get it that way. 
And those are eight kilo bags of chicken pellets, so there's 10 of those. There's 80 kilos of chicken pellets put on the two plots. About three weeks before planting. Um, most of it would know, but most fertilizers, especially organic ones, have to break down for the plant to take it to be a, a, available. There's no good putting buffish and bone down and plant and plant and think it's going to get fed. It will take two to three weeks for it to start breaking down to be available to the plant. Plan ahead. I'm going to plant in two weeks' time. I'll put some fertilizer down. A little bit in the hole won't hurt. Too much in the hole will scorch the roots. So you're better to fertilize the bed than the hole. Um, and that's pretty much what we're going to do. Over the years, I've had all sorts of concoctions. And you sort of use one thing, you think, oh, I'll try that, you're too frightened not to use that because it worked last year, so you add it on, and then you add another one on. It's like making a, one of these cakes that you pass to everyone, and they all add their own ingredients in, and it goes round and round. Um, but really, there's only me. Chicken pellets are a good source of high nitrogen for a short period of time, about six weeks. This lasts a bit longer. I've used straw in the past, always have, always believed in it. Um, but then until the year I got straw that had herbicide in it, which does happen, it's not supposed to. Um, so it's against the law to not to use broad leaf residual herbicides on wheat crops, but they are still used. It doesn't affect corn, it's, it's a monocotyledon, not dicotyledon. So it's only got one left seed leaf, doesn't affect it. Two seed leaves kill them. And they use it to stop weeds growing in the corn. The corn will take it up into the plant, when that breaks down, you get residual amounts coming into the soil, which don't as soon to show you they don't like, as will peas and things. So if you use uh, manure, if you can, plant some pea seeds in it, you know, in the soil. If they come up, germinate, grow well, you'll be fine. They're the best signal of, of problems. I trusted the face. Unfortunately sent someone else to get it, it wiped out the year. Um, luckily I realised quick enough, got it all off, disposed of it, and left the ground open for the year to wash through and, and recover. Because of that, I then used my face. It works. It keeps the moisture in the ground, ground cool, clean, I'm not going around with a hoe every 10 minutes trying to stop any weeds. Um, Bit of pain to put down and a real pain to plant through. But um, as I say, don't do it because it's easy. Plants go up to the allotment, and you see they're still in the three inch pots. Um, about a week before planting, getting used to it. I don't like the word hardening off, I don't want to harden the plant, I want it acclimatised. You know, if you start getting yellowing or, or dark colouring on the leaves, it's because it's too tough and they're showing signs of that. So don't rush. This is a plant of Mori Gold. Now how do you do it different? How do I do it different? These old boys, they come out of the ground and they tell you these stories like Moby Dick and coming out of the sea. I want to bury these leaves, these leaf joints. That's what I thought. If I bury it and I force it, the only way it's going to grow is out of the ground. And when it grows out of the ground, we'll grow potatoes or have done probably and you earth them up. And you earth them up because you get new roots from the stem, new tubers, more stock, keeps them upright. Helps all around. I want to treat these like potatoes. But I can't earth them up because there's a fabric on there. All I have to do is plant them deep and hope. So I remove the leaves, you can see them here. Two joints, so I know there's four shoots potentially down there. Chicken pellets in the hole, don't really use the other stuff because it takes too long to go. It just makes me feel better that I've got something in there. A big hole, I did this. Aside, because trying to show it through fabric isn't fun. And you can see white roots, no brown roots, it's not copper bound, it's happy, and it goes in. This pair of leaves here is the first pair of leaves you see there. So it's actually got one of three pairs under the ground. And plant in a well, it's always just leave a well around it so when you're watering or it rains, walk to the roots, it's not running off down the path or going anywhere else. If you've got a bit of company, it's quite helpful. It's just Poppy, and she used to come up with me all the time. And you can see the plants now in the ground low, plants on the left ready to go in tall, and that's where they're being buried. And this is through the mypex. Um, bit of a pain in the watering cans when the plants 
huge, trying to find the hole to pour the water in, but um, we do what we have to. Um, slugs. They don't like babies. Um, slug pellets, there's a big thing, there has been a big thing about slug pellets. Um, some terror hide was the naughty stuff. No arms. That has been slug pellets for about four years. Um, because they knew they were the, the, the people that produced knew it was getting banned a long time ago. It went into court, it got banned, but there was a, an issue with the way it had it and it was given another year. But at that time, it wasn't, it wasn't in there anyway. So most and it will also have it predominantly now are uh, cornstarch. It's a soup tough wheat mix. Um, and basically, the slug ingests the cornstarch, it does that. It dehydrates and blows them up. So they're not the baggies that they used to be, and they used to be bad. Um, you know, if you've got to get a bit of cornstarch or something, put it on its back, it doesn't have to be a tough. Um, but what I do do is use them, but use them correctly. So you may, let's get soap pellets across the plot. You only need 10 per square metre. So you can't see. If it looks like it's been raining slug pellets, you've done it wrong, too much. Um, they've got an attractant in there to attract the slugs. So all you're going to do is attract every slug in the neighbourhood to where you don't want them. You just want to remove what's there. And they'll be sitting there waiting under the ground for these plants to come in. They also breed in May. So if you can stop them before they're a problem, they're not a problem. And it's one application, just one. I don't use more than a half the tubs of snorting now because we get one over to use them. So the 250 gram tubs that you can buy, one of those does both plots, it's the only time you use them. So it's about, you know, chemicals are bad things used incorrectly, but they're quite useful to use in the right way, um, which is always a problem. So the first stick, that one makes a hole, marks a hole. They use a bar's bottom and a blowtorch to take them out. It's woven, you can't cut it with a knife, it frays and it just gets in the way of it. So the blowtorch, just go around, you end up with loads, loads of cabbage collars, if anyone grows cabbages <laughs> from it. But it seals the hole, and the first cane marks where I need to do that, and it also becomes the first support stick of the plant, and it stays there, it goes into the bag. Creating an inverted wig weighing tub helps support the plant. But you don't need to put the others in, just get in the way until the plant's bigger. Plant it out, need to cut the grass, but you always people spend far too long cutting grass and not enough time growing and stuff in, in the months to grow in between. But, um, they're out, first week of June, and they don't much to do. It's all trim. They will get feed about once a week um, of, of a high nitrogen liquid feed. Probably be this long food. I use a professional one, that just means you can buy in big bags. And they get, I get through 75 kilos of soluble feed a year. So it's 400 plants. You can scale that down, it's not so painful. And they soon grow and they put their arms out, so it's like, you know, yeah, me, I'm here. Now, giants will be giants, so they, if you plant it in the garden, stops it, watered it, it would probably give you an 8 to 10 inch flower. That's what they do. You can't make a pom a giant, a giant pom or anything else. But they are what they are. Um, I can't shrink and I can't grow, but I have any. So, you get them in, and then what I'm trying to do is get them to their absolute potential. And as I said, when I was a kid, you know, but quite a long time ago now, I could buy 100 litres at school in 13 seconds. That's over there, one else. But the world record is only 10, it's three seconds, nothing. But the work you have to put in to gain that three seconds is the sun is getting a 10 inch flower to a 12, 13, 14 inch flower with form that will compete at the national level. So they grow. And they grow. And then they get chopped. So about the end of June, middle to end of June, depends on the variety, some are later than others, our frames is late, the breeds are late, so you do it mid-June, going forwards, um, how do I get the stems out of the ground? Well the plant won't want to do it on its own. So you cut the top out like you would normally stop in the plant, make sure you do, don't 
let the crown bud flow off, stop it, plant it, get the brakes slow, let them flow out. Um, chop out the top and I'll remove every side sheet that's above ground. And then some of them, when this long when you do it, take them all off. There's nowhere else that plant can grow other than the ones that I bury. It takes a bit of bravery when you've not done it before. And most of the other growers in the country thought I was nuts. <laughs> you can't do that. Can you? I'll do it. And if you half do it, if you leave the bottom ones go off, security measure, I'll leave them too. Then what's above ground will always grow, you know? So you have to commit. <laughs> commit to it and are committed. But what you've built up is a root system and a plant and a base to, to grow. It's a bit like chopping a shrub back that's been in the garden for 10 years. Chop it back, it grows three times quicker than it ever did because it's got roots and a base to work from. And here they come. Top picture, first tip. So it takes about a week to 10 days. You get a bit twitchy through that period. Um, and what I would do over a batch of 12 plants is do four one week, four another week, four another week. So you spread that, that flush a little bit. If the first one's wrong, the middle one might make it. If the middle one's wrong, there are things we can do to tweak them later, but Spread, spread that out. That, and a few days later, they're, they're like, and there's more than three come up, and you often get them from the roots of four as well. There's a plant, this is the same plant. They're under the foliage of canopy of the, the original plant, and at some point you'll notice that the main plant looks a bit sad, it's like a rose for suckers. But the suckers are the dahlias from lower taking all the energy from the main plant. And it gets cut off. And that's the old plant. So there's nothing left of what went in the ground. And which is why you get the tuber with the three stems. Come down as soon as you're confident that these are big enough to sustain growth. You need leaf coverage. Plants don't grow without leaves. Um, which is why you don't just go pop at ground level and you'll find they'll probably die. So they remove the old plant. Leave the shoots, let the shoots, and you can see throughout the plots that they're growing. And they grow. And from this point, we're probably now um, somewhere around about the middle of July. In six weeks' time, they've got around 12 inch flowers in the winter. Um, experience says they will. <laughs> Don't always really trust in experience sometimes, but in the end, they get there. And you can see the thickness stems now that are coming out. It's just about that uh, in the coverage. As I said, watering cans, I can't use a hose pipe against the rules. So everything is two to go in watering cans from the horse trough that is about from here to those doors away to the first plant and the plants go backwards. So water is normally one can between three or four plants or a feed and then as we go later in the season it becomes three plants, two plants. Um, and several times a week. They do like to do water. They feed the spoonful in the can, dip, give it a shake. <laughs> and about, so we're talking about 70 cans would be a light water, progressing up to about 120 years, me giving them a, a proper drink. Um, and I'll do that before I go to work. It takes me about two hours. Um, so I'm there at oh, five, six in the morning, I'll give it done before I go to work. I only spend from um, July onwards, on, on average, about 14 hours a week growing them. I'm quite efficient about it. Um, I, you know, I work full time, I work on certain weekends, I have a Wednesday off, that's my main day. Um, the rest of it is up to early in the mornings, not on the Friday because I play darts on Thursday for a quite a good team, so I'm not really in a bit safe for getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and playing dangerous. Um, I don't do it on the weekends off because of this life. This was the year before, and I felt sorry for them flagging, so I put a bit of net over them. When it's 40 degrees, it doesn't matter what size on top of them, the air temperature is 40 degrees, not the sun. They will flag, and don't worry. You know, it's just the fact that the plant can't suck it out quick enough, uh, and you're growing big, leafy cabbage and plants. Still, so built the other cover, it's only four for two. To stretch the whole thing over later when a new one went up. It's a one litre water bottle, just give you an idea of the, what's coming up from the ground. 
and that's what's underneath these leaves on the right. And you cut it back again. And then my ring, this is all happening over about three weeks. They really do fly. Hence the thing. Um, these are wall pellets that I tried to see if it done anything. Not like I saw any signs. But um, I won't bother again. I didn't. So the same goes, you see the other canes are in, front two. <clears throat> and they're two foot apart, and you want the plants to fill the two foot space. So angle them out to fill it. Don't do that with it. You don't want to truss them up like a chicken, you want them to fill the space. And then we get some bats, we get excited. Now, within a, a plant, I'm saying this is a beaver. That's it. <clears throat> Slightly larger one there. You can see I've already removed the side shoots. Get in there. As soon as you can get in there, do it. If you do that with your garden plants, look at a footstool. If you leave it to the things there and these big bit buds sticking out the sides, it's too late. The stem will set according to that. So as soon as you see the bud in there, you can literally get in there with your fingers and wiggle out the sides, do so. And it just means that and the next pair down. You're not losing flowers because the third pair of these has got shoots. That little wood demon is going to take on a miniature 20 odd days before it's flowering, by which time most shoots are up and got their own ones and we're replacing so you get a natural succession. The fear of losing flowers is the fear of having rubbish stems and flowers that face the ground when it rains. I do it three flowers to the plant only and every side shoot is removed and I will spend like, the hands and knees going around under the plant making sure nothing else has come up, there's nothing else on the stem and then the buds come. You can see the spread. You've got big buds, no buds, little buds and that's me spreading that batch of plants over, over the period. The bud comes out before I want it, i.e. it's 40 days before the first show. Take the top out, go down the stem and I'll, it's about a week per joint. So that third pair of leaves is two weeks, two and a half weeks behind that one. Hence why that takes two and a half weeks, you cut it, that's already there. So you can delay that stem by a week, two weeks, three weeks, and allow just that one shoot to come up and become the flowering stem on that shoot. And that way you can literally window every flower within that three week period. And you get thumbs and fingers like that. For doing it because they don't have to stain your fingers when you're rubbing down the stem. Um, and you keep them walking, you keep them feeding. Rule of thumb June nitrogen feeds, July balance feeds, August potash feeds. Lots of gin, tomato food, etc. You should potash feed. <coughs> so you're building up the plant, you're ripening it up, you're hardening it off. It's just a natural routine. One without the other, one look. You can't just throw those nitrogen in a plant. And then expect it to have stems that stand up. You've got to balance the equation. A balanced diet. And they come. And then we get some buds. And you think, oh, I've got, got it right here. I think I've sort of got the idea of this. So this is the first year that these rides on the road. I think, well, that bud's that big, it's going to be a decent flower. The only time I ever use a ring on giants is the large ring. Because in Brook Show rooms, they have to be bigger than 10 inches. <coughs> they don't have to be, but you're going to get knocks if they're not. That's a, the large ring is for the large, which are up to 10 inches, but the rolls give you a three quarters of an inch race. So it's a 10 and three quarter inch ring. So I find out that that bud's only thrown back three rows of petals. There's 300 petals in one of these. And it's hitting that large ring, it's not going to be small. I don't have to worry about that. Um, there's a green turtle coming out. At that point, week before the shows, the covers go up. <coughs> it's not needed in the garden. You're really, if you're going to do it for cut flower, you'll cut them half open. And they'll last in the vase. We're showing flowers, that's why they look tired in there now, at their absolute limit. In which case, some of those first petals are probably pushing on for nearly two weeks old. And they're around the back. You get a good downpour. Yeah, it's gone. It's far as shown. So these go up. The next thing is just a sort of wing wrapped in the sides of them. Um, but people think they're growing greenhouses, they're growing, they're not, they're growing outside with a couple over the top just to protect the rain. The Americans and Canadians do it with umbrellas. 
they, they've got a different way of show, so they don't grow beets and they grow lots of different varieties. And when they see the flower, they go, great, they eat a steak and can tie an umbrella to it. Works, that's the truth, that's the truth. But on mass, it's easier to put the cover down. And they're, they're at that stage. So these would be the first flowers for the bank holiday weekend, which is when the shows generally start, running through to, to national. Dahlia selfies. <laughs> There's no one else up there at that time of the morning, but so that's the self to so our friends. He's still young, still got time to go. You see the size of the century in there, if it comes from the middle. So I know that that flower actually did go to, to the Midland show, because it was about three days before then. Right, so we did. Um, the term as big as your head doesn't apply the bigger. I haven't got a full wing in the head. Right. Some might say I do. <clears throat> so to do 12 varieties, you don't grow 12 varieties. There isn't 12 reliable varieties in any one year. So that year I had 32 varieties. Some of them only a few parts of each down there. Just in case, have a look. Do I want to grow more of it next year? The new varieties might have been imported. The established ones are in, in 12s and so on. And you're trying to get them all out for, for the show, so for the maximum choice. There's that American one, the Bonaventure. Some good stock of that. All from Pot Tuber. This year, I was stupid. And I went, these plants were fantastic. Kept the tuber, took the cuttings from the tuber. There's still a row of 12, but they're only that tall. There's one that has to come from Pot Tuber, has to come from that rested stuff. It's, and I, I convinced myself I knew better. Yeah, I didn't. Can you see the pipe breaking up there? Just about at the top there. <coughs> okay, so if this bloom comes out, you think you're not going to come up enough. We're looking for no more than 45 degree angle. Um, ideally, the giant's sitting on top because they open better. You can, a bit of pipe lagging up the stem, lift its chin up as it opens, tie it on, and you can adjust the angle slightly. I didn't do it at all this year because invariably the best flowers are the ones that come out as they should. This is me trying to make sure of every flower, but I didn't worry about it this year. And then showtime. How do you get the flowers to a show? You don't chuck them in the back of your car, no. You don't take them in bunches. These are 25 litre plasterous buckets. Um, and just drill around the sides. Cut the stem, you don't need to cane these, it's smaller flowers, and put a split cane on and wire that in. These have got seven foot sorts like that, and stems at the base as thick as your wrist. So they go in, you can only fit two in, because otherwise the flowers will go, they cut the side to the sides, into the car, or into the van, and off we go. So that would have been what I took to, to the middle of the show, plus a couple of extras. And the varieties again, so we have Ramsey, Louis White at the top, Pink Spur, Spur. Bonaventure, in my mind Bonaventure was the best blooming show of um, England. Yeah, squeeze me. <laughs> Should have took the band. I could fit about 18 giants in the back, so they were the six, purposely brought for moving flowers around. Um, and I would just about fit 18, and then if I need to squeeze any more, and then the front seat, as you can see, gets the bucket as well. Um, so the two cutting can die on the left bucket on the ground. But use paper, station, that's all we use, single curves, bit of paper. And the paper around the drums is to stop any moisture from here coming up underneath the drums and getting those pretty brown spots. And um, also if it slops, don't want it. It's quite handy to start putting in the bars between the station as well, it's really scratched for it. And then most county shows, Midlands, Essex, Kent, Surrey, um, which is Sunday, if anyone wants to go, Sunday, Surrey show. Um, <coughs> Giants is six, that's the most likely show, which is quite wasteful when you've got 380 plants and a thousand flowers. But you're growing up for that, not this. And quite often, and I could found, again, you're on your own. Not everyone always grows and not has them on the day. So I wonder, class, should do, it's only the beginning. 
Um, but there's a whole show like in there, the whole show full. So what you can then do is look to try and get the best exhibit in the show or if you can lift the sand and catch the judge's eye, then you're up there. Um, which I did get the best exhibit in the show. And this was the best giant in the show for the venture. Until you sort of most of the time you're behind them or in front of the bows, and you're behind them, so you grow a bit, wouldn't they? There's a guy who I've made throws so late like jacks and he always holds his flowers like that. It's a bit like the fisherman. Yeah. <laughs> um, not that easy with these. And then you have three blooms, which is your next best three in single blooms. So the best ten flowers is what you can show. Then that was on the Friday night, Saturday, the Nessex on the Sunday, so we back to the clock, cut another lot of flowers. And these would have been a bit big for the day before, trying to get the most out of them. These are all green turf all with a, a little bit white in the middle. <laughs> You use the best flowers you've got, it doesn't have to be six different, just the best that's there on the day. And that one's I've got the, the best exhibit in show. Then you get the odd extraordinary flower, but invariably they always turn up just between shows. <laughs> Never quite on the day, and that was a, a fantastic green circle. You can see the size of it, I think I've measured it around about 15 and a bit inches. Um, and the form, it's not size, this is the giants, but it's form. We're looking for the petal gradient now with layers like tiles on the roof. They'll never be as accurate as, as the smalls and miniatures because they're, they're big. But that's what we're trying to get. You can see that layer has got more form than that one. See this bit of looseness around here. And that would just be seen as, as faults. But the, the winner is the one with the least faults. There's no such thing as a perfect layer when it's got ground petals. It's the one with the least. Then we have a show at Hyde Hall. I run there in the hilltop. Um, and there's the six, and you can get all your ribbons. Best exhibit to show, best giant was the very white. See, that one's a bit neater than the other yellow one around here. Then off to Kenny. There's me, and there's the opposition. You see, there's a size difference. That's uh, the risk getting them out of the ground and giving them the extra bit makes that much difference. Moving the, moving the bar. And then we come to the national time, and that's what we're faced with. Go and cut your flowers. <laughs> um, you do. But you need 12 different varieties, not just the best ones. You have to have 12 different. And that's the fun, fun of it. So there's one adventure still going. And then we cut them. 55 flowers I think I cut into the band today. There's 12 blooms, 9 blooms, 6 blooms, 3 blooms, a single colour of glass shell, so you should more, it's a better here, and one or more. Um, and we'll pick that room so we can the other. We cut the day before the judgment, so if they judge tomorrow morning, we cut them yesterday morning, or this morning, or tomorrow morning. Um, they're freshest, if you wait till the evening and the sun's been out, you haven't got time the next day. So somewhere cool and, and out of direct sunlight into the normal waste band, they're just about fit. Um, we just squeeze some large at the back here in the end. Um, and off we go to so, here. Yeah. And we're back to that one again. Up with the 12. Um, best exhibit show, best giant can show. There was three of us in there that, that year. And the spare nine. That, our frames were huge. Um, I had it in the 12 and someone went, can't do that, it made the other sort of small. It didn't matter in the 9. Um, and it had a few, it was just getting a little bit tired in the face, so I swapped it around and it ended up there. Um, and the blue on the right, the yellow card, that was the second best giant can show. And the 6, and the 3. You can see the show last year was a bit fuller than this year in the background. Best giant on the left, second best on the right, and I'm not doing that, just that. Um, and they're impressive, they're an impressive thing, and it does sort of, uh, they're, a, they're a showstopper. When you walk in there and you see them at their best, it's like, cool. And I also found the six large and the one there as well. Some varieties are unclassified. Um, so you can use them 
where they fit. And some don't naturally grow big like these. And you get the odd big one and some smaller ones. And as long as it goes through that ring, yeah, you can go in as a large, as long as it's not classified as a giant. So I found six that fit with that and one that's well. And some spares are in the society class with small decks and small captains. There you go. <laughs> and next year is this year. And this year I couldn't find 12. Did nine when I won the line, but I think it was a year not to enjoy growing. Um, until next year again. Any questions? Don't ask. No. Yeah. I'm working on it. It's um, it's it happens all the time, and it's worse when you grow the others that you have not just got three flowers. You might have 10, 12, 15 flowers on the plant. You grow to show, um, and that's all I'm worried about. Um, so the bloom is, is a possible flower to go to a show until it's not. And normally that's when the pack's gone on the center pot. And at that point, it's a flower that's likely to cause damage to any flower that might go to the show if the wind blows or gets in the way. At that point, it is literally snapped off the joint, thrown under the, I'm not composting, it goes up under the plants. Um, and it, yeah, that's the mercenary part of it. After the shows, you don't get much of a second flush on those, but they were in the end. Normal ones, you get other flowers and then you can do it like them. And the rule up the allotments is don't touch. Um, when the covers go up, really don't touch. When the covers come down, help yourself. And then there's always a few flowers that run on the second flush. And it's all it's a bit like the old, yeah. you can have that. <laughs> Because people can't help it. Oh, it don't feel real, does it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm not there all the time, so what happens, I hope, is, is not that. Um, so, yeah, don't get the vows at the end. But it is a mercenary thing, but it, if you, I'm trying to yeah. set a, a different level. How essential is that heat map? You showed it under your tubers yeah. in the season. Do, do we need to do that? If we're not interested in showing, we just want lovely dahlias. Um, it helps because certainly in January, if you're just doing it in the garden and your tubers are sand, i.e. they're not rotting or they're good or you just bought them from the garden centre, do it in March and pop them on the windowsill, that's fine. I'm only doing that because of the, the the delicateness of the tuber itself wanting to rot. Um, but normally, for a garden point of view, if you, if you wake them up in March, windsill, they're in your house, your house is going to be 70. So that's enough. Uh, wake them up and put them somewhere cool and light and let them tick over. It's just you can't fit. I don't think someone would be very happy if I put up the windsill around the tubers around the house. But yeah, it's time of the year, July, January, and immediate. The light levels are low, the day levels are short, the plant will naturally want to think it's time to grow by March. It, it, it will, and there's plenty of time to take cuttings if you want to even or split them and plant them. What about growing in, in pots? I, I didn't used to have the picture of it in there. The guy called Tom Bevinson, he um, was a great, great giant grower. And he moved, he stopped growing out of the nursery, he moved into the house, he then got Parkinson's. He realised that he was only going to be able to ever grow them again for a short time. So in his house in uh, Nuneaton, he grew 40 plants in the ground, dug up his lawn, or someone dug up his lawn, and the rest were in 20 litre pots on the steps going up, on the pat air going round, and then he had 80 plants in all. Grown in pots, one plant in a pot, three flowers in a plant, grown exactly as in the ground, you just have to make sure they don't dry out. And then it, I went up there because he, he had flowers for Northern National. I was growing, I cut his flowers, took them to the show, and he won the 12 up for Northern National. But I had to lift off the washing up bowls off, over the top, which were the covers over the individual flowers and the umbrellas that were there. So, yes, you grow in pots, but you want to. Minimum 20 litres 
and pop one set of plug over and two you just dry up the grit. Smaller the, the plant, the more. And don't get confused with giants being giants. You can get giants that are six foot tall, giants that are three foot tall, you can get miniatures that are six foot tall. I mean, we're only talking about the flower, not the heart, for example. Do you have any seeds? No. Um, to get new varieties, you have to grow from seed. You have to take seed from other flowers. But um, roughly, it's 11, it's 1100 genes in a plant that denotes what the flower is going to be. You cross the same variety with the same variety, it's 1100 times 1100 possible outcomes. Cross it with a different variety, you add it times that by another 1100 possible outcomes. So that would be a flower with five flower leaf petals on it, to a full flower, different colours, shapes. So people that raise new varieties only raise new varieties because they, they've got bits of seeds that they're trying to see what the flower is, and ones that they said well, might be alright growing the next year, ones that last year were all okay. So it becomes a a three year process. Three years the plant settled and it becomes persistent from cutting. The moment it takes seed, you will never get what you took it from. Any more? If so, you know, over in the tent, I'll probably go over there anyway. Titus asked me or anyone else that's sitting behind the, the tent in there and uh, they'll answer whatever you've got. Thank you.